So our next speaker is David Greenspan from the Meteor Core team. In 2008, David wrote Etherpad, a collaborative real-time web editor, and unwittingly reinvented operational transformation in the process. He then sold Etherpad to Google and worked on Google Wave and Google App Engine. In early 2012, David became Meteor's first engineering hire and has been a leading architect of Meteor's front-end rendering systems, among other projects. Tonight, David will be speaking about his work with Meteor's new version solver. Please welcome David. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, the new version solver. This has been my main project for the last couple months um, because we had some issues post 1.0 and we said, you know what, we need to take a hard look at this. Um, so it's just about ready to go. There's a preview release you might have seen on the mailing list. Um, it's going to go into one of the um, upcoming media releases soon. Um, I tend to put too much in my talks, but this is what I'm going to try to cover. Uh, why we rewrote it, what we ran into basically, um, why constraint solvers are always a little bit slow, and why we need them anyway, and then an overview of the architecture of the new version solver, which is pretty cool, and then a demo of the uh, logic solver package I wrote, which lets you do sort of general purpose constraint solving in JavaScript. So we had a problem, which was users were running in saying, I ran Meteor Update, and it just hung forever, or seemingly forever. It turns out it was only hanging for about seven minutes, but no one stuck around that long. <laughs> um, so the version solver, some of you might be familiar with it, but it's sort of one of those under the hood things. It just makes things work. It's also known as the constraint solver, the version resolver, um, and also different package managers will call it different things. Mainly what it does is it runs whenever you say Meteor Update or Meteor Add or Meteor Remove. Um, and it figures out what version of each package to update to. And this includes all of your packages, your top level packages that you depend on directly, but also the packages your packages depend on and so on and so on. So all the packages that you pull in. And it makes sure these packages are all mutually compatible with each other. And this is hard for the computer to do. It's a, it's a large search space for it to look through. Um, it's sort of analogous to a Sudoku or a scheduling problem that you might learn about in algorithms class that's like you know, the NP complete problem. Um, for example, you have to schedule airlines to gates or you have to schedule students for classes, figure out when the class, what the class schedule should be. Um, but even if it's hard for the computer, it's even harder for a person potentially to go through and like jigger all these versions. Um, but we know it can be done you know, in a few seconds by a command line tool because um, that's what Rails Bundler does. That's what all the Linux package managers do. Um, it's also used by Eclipse for their plugins. Uh, why is it so hard? Just to expand on that, there's a combinatorial explosion of possibilities. Uh, depending on your starting point, depending on whether you have a .media versions file um, in your project, there might be many different versions to choose from for each package. And there's nothing that says different versions of the same package have to have similar dependencies at all. So usually they do. Usually when you write a package, you depend on maybe one other package or 10 other packages, and then they only change a little bit from version to version, but we can't make that assumption in general. Um, if you think about how you solve a Sudoku, you probably say, oh, maybe this square is a three. Let's see you know, what follows from that. Um, if you're lucky, you get a, a contradiction pretty quickly, and you say, okay, that's not a three. Uh, if you're unlucky, you could have, you know, well, what if this is an eight, and you could sort of get into these sub-scenarios and sub-sub-scenarios and have to kind of dig your way back out. So basically, it's fast if you make good guesses, if you like make good hypotheses that give you information quickly, and then you learn from them. Um, but if you're not being smart about it, you can kind of get stuck in these rat holes where you're just kind of saying, well, what about this version? Eh, it could be. Um, it's, it's similar to Sudoku in that, you know, when you first start solving the puzzle, there's, you feel like there's just all these possibilities, but then as it fills up, you're like, oh wait, maybe the very first thing I did was totally wrong, um, and I need to kind of backtrack all the way out. Um, so in embarking on this project, I decided to stop and also think about, well, why do we have a constraint solver? Um, this is, this is kind of new to me. Like, I'm not an expert in package uh, managers, or at least I wasn't before this project. Um, so I had to kind of like brush up on this stuff. Um, 
Mainly what it does is it keeps you from having to edit the dependencies, the versions of the dependencies of your project manually. Um, in particular, when you add a new package or you update a package, um, if you didn't have the constraint solver, you would probably have to go in and manually tweak a bunch of versions. Um, and in theory, adding a new package could require you to upgrade another package. That's pretty common, like, you know, going from 1.0.6 to 1.0.7 of Iron Router also updates all the other Iron Router packages, say. Um, in theory, an upgrade of one package could also prevent you from being able to upgrade another package, or it could require you to downgrade it um, in some kind of, you know, edge cases. And as packages pull in more packages, this, there's stuff in your project you don't necessarily know about. It's some library used by some library you used. Um, so if there's some way to satisfy all the semantic versioning constraints of all the packages, <coughs> it seems like the tools just do that for you. Um, but we can also look what other package managers do. So most of them either have a constraint solver or they would benefit from a constraint solver. You can find tutorials on you know, what happens when you have conflicts in Bower. Well, you go in and you, you know, fiddle with the versions. You kind of manually resolve them. Um, same thing with the, Py with the uh, Python package manager from what I've read. Um, the, there's, you can also find different examples of constraint solvers, um, like in, in Debian and the Linux distros. Um, the Rails bundler, which works out really well. And then uh, Eclipse, they published a paper basically on you know, why they do this, uh, what constraint solver they use, and all the benefits of that. Um, if you're in kind of an NPM world, you might not know about this whole constraint solving thing. If you're from a Rails world, you'll say, yay, constraint solver is awesome. Um, if you're from an, a node world, you might say, well, wait, like, does NPM have a constraint solver? So just a rundown on like, NPM's a little different. It does something that not, not everybody realizes it does, which is when package A asks for package B, it actually gets a fresh copy of package B inside the, inside the package's directory. So basically, you have these nested packages. Um, so if a bunch of different packages use underscore, say, you could have like 10 different versions of underscore in your node app, and you just wouldn't know it, because you know there's plenty of room on disk. There's plenty of room in memory. And the way the node module system is designed, you know, each module just exports stuff to the thing that required it. The modules can't you know, talk to each other. They can't, you know, they can't register in some global namespace. Sometimes they do anyway, but generally they don't. Um, so this is a, a multiple loading model as opposed to a single loading model where you only load uh, one version of each package. Um, in general, it blows up the code size, even though that's kind of less important on the server. It's definitely important on the client. You don't want to ship like a whole bunch of different versions of you know, jQuery or Bootstrap to the client, even if you manage to, to isolate them and say some components can use Bootstrap 2, some can use Bootstrap 3. Um, apparently, you can, you can work on your NPM app or on your, on your Node app to achieve single loading, but it's not kind of a default thing. It's not necessarily straightforward. So the upshot is it's actually a cool model, like the way you know, modules work. Um, it's got some strengths and some limitations. Definitely, I wouldn't say you never want a multiple load. Like in a real app that gets big, eventually you might want two versions of underscore. You're like, no, the only way I can make this, this work you know, is to have like, two different versions of underscore. OK, so like, we're actually we're going to support that eventually. There's nothing that says you know, we can't support that. But as a, as a default, as a starting point, especially with you're serving client JavaScript, you're serving CSS, you're serving you know, images and assets and stuff. Um, you get a lot of power from single loading your packages. Also, you get stuff like Meteor add accounts. So when you say add accounts, it can actually you know, add some infrastructure. It can add a database table. It can add an endpoint um, and all the stuff that you're used to in Meteor. Um, so yeah, in summary, it automates the work of adjusting your package versions. Um, it's necessary for single loading. And um, it's an industry best practice. So I'm going to go quickly through a. Um, through a scenario, just so you can see why you know what the constraint solver has to do. So this is a scenario where your your app depends on one package called Bob UI, um, and Bob UI depends on another package called XML Parser. So you've added Bob UI to your app. You also got XML Parser automatically, um, and the version solver automatically chooses the versions. It'll probably take the latest version of Bob UI because there's no constraints on it, so it prefers the latest. Um, and then it'll take 1.0.3 of XML Parser, because that's what was asked for. 
Um, if you now type meteor add x query, some hypothetical package, um, well, if x query 3.0.1 depends on a newer version of XML parser, version 1.0.4, then uh, the constraint solver automatically rolls forward the version of XML parser. And that's easy. That's you know, updating a package that you don't depend on directly. It'll probably print a message saying that it did it, but then you're all set. Um, now suppose you add this package called Furnace Helper. You, you can speculate what that might do. Um, so in the catalog in Atmosphere, um, in the cloud, you probably have different versions of Furnace Helper. And if you can take the latest, that's great. Um, if the latest version happens to depend on a newer version of XML parser, version 2, well, that's a, that's a different major version. We can't just you know, upgrade XML parser version 2. So it'll automatically uh, upgrade to version 1.0.1 of Furnace Helper. It won't take uh, the upgrade that would cause a conflict. And generally, conflicts are like one package needs version one of something, another package needs version two, stuff like that. Um, but you know, in some cases, there's actually a lot of possibilities available to the version solver. Maybe you know, if you depend on Furnace Helper indirectly, maybe there's some path that doesn't even require Furnace Helper at all. So it gets pretty complicated. Um, I'm going to tweak this example a bit. Oh, the other thing to say about this is that you know, hopefully. Bob UI and XQuery have been updated. So maybe it can just roll those versions forward by you know, a patch, and now they depend on XML parser 2. And the cool thing is if that's possible, it'll just do that for you automatically. Um, so XML parser is a utility library. So everything I've been talking about is like make sure you have the right version of the utility library. I think it's interesting to change this example around and say, what if actually what, what you have is you depend on three packages that are all kind of plugins to this umbrella framework, Bob UI. So they all depend on Bob UI. Um, it could be the same example, except now, instead of wanting to pick the right version of a utility library, we are trying to pick the right version of a framework. So you know, we have all these plugins. They have different requirements, requirements on what version of the framework they're compatible with. It'll automatically choose the right version of the framework. And in that case, you know, Bob UI could be something like jQuery. Like we don't want to ship down multiple versions of that. Um, it's pretty clear. Um, and then a note, like you know, in the real world, I mean, major version changes are always sticky. If you're a, a package maintainer, especially of a popular package or a framework type package, um, you know, you have to be careful about bumping major versions always. Um, in this case, if you were the author of Bob UI Sparkles, one thing you could do is issue a patch that makes it work with the old version and the new version of the framework. Um, there's this syntax where you can say, um, in your package.js, you can say this version or this other version. So it's actually possible to write packages that support multiple major versions of a framework. Um, OK, so having decided, OK, we like uh, constraint solvers. They're cool. They do good stuff for us. Um, how do we speed up our solver? Well, we already implemented the basic heuristics that would kind of come to mind if you've done a Sudoku. Like, oh, I want to start with a square that you know, only has two possibilities, um, and stuff like that. The only way to get more powerful is we don't really want to write all the rules ourselves, um, is to upgrade to a more powerful solver, and preferably one we can just plug in or you know, integrate with. So my design for this project was to take Minisat which is an open source project written in C++. It's a SAT solver, meaning you give it a constraint problem in a very constrained form. It only solves for true false variables. All the constraints have to be of the form, you know, at least one of these variables is true. Um, but in exchange, what you get from it is you get a lot of power. It's based on decades of research into, you know, you have this open-ended problem. How do you narrow the solution space? What facts should I drive first? And then, you know, how do I use that to derive other facts and arrive at a contradiction or arrive at a solution? Um, I want to note that using Emscripten to compile C++ to JavaScript actually works really, really well. Um, I'd never used Emscripten before. Uh, it was easier to get running than a real C++ compiler because, you know, I was on a Mac and they built it for Linux, so I got all these, like, warnings. Um, I never actually succeeded in uh, getting Minisat to run just normally on my Mac, but I got it to run in JavaScript which is even cooler. And we can also always you know, have, we can always run the native uh, version too 
and link against the native compiled version. Um, so what I did when I had Minisat in JavaScript was I built a package around it called Logic Solver that is more of a traditional logic programming package. So you can say, you know, I have all these variables and exactly three of these are true and at most one of these is true. You can have integers. You can do kind of like integer inequality programming. Um, it's general enough that you can just plug in Sudoku. You can plug in the Meteor package version problem, including constraints like change as few packages as possible. You know, oh, OK, I have to like change seven packages. It's not possible to only change six, that kind of stuff. So it does a lot of stuff. It's a Meteor core package, and it's also the kind of package I'm interested in getting on NPM, because I think like, the whole JavaScript community could use this. Um, some languages just come with a logic programming package, like Clojure has one called core.logic. Um, in Java, everybody uses sat4j, which is a really powerful constraint solver. Um, so anyway, this is just the API. So yeah, if you're interested in uh, using this to do something cool, uh, drop me a line. Um, this is a Sudoku app that I just whipped up. It's a Meteor app. Um, I forgot the thick lines, so you just have to imagine those. Um, so the black numbers are the problem. The green numbers are the solution that it found. And actually, it solved it when I loaded the page. It solves it so quickly that you can't really see it solving it. <laughs> um, so <laughs> what I had to do was, OK, let's make it interactive. What if I delete this 9? Well, now it gives me everything that can go in these other squares. So I could make a new puzzle. I could say, OK, this could be a 3 or a 7. Let's make it a 3. And then let's make this a 1. And it tells me when you know, one of them only has one possibility. OK, better. S <laughs> in practice, this went much faster. I just filled in like two squares, and it was all done. Um, but so what this is actually doing, and I'm amazed it's actually this fast, is it says, OK, solve the puzzle. OK, that's one solution. Um, is there a solution where the top left square has a 1 in it? No? OK. Is there a solution where the top left square has a 2 in it? There is? OK, put a 2. And it runs through the entire grid, um, recalling the solver um, for every possible number for that square. And because it's an incremental solver, it basically you know, remembers everything it's learned which makes subsequent you know, queries like that really, really fast. Like if there's only two solutions, um, it'll give you one of them. And if you say, no, not that one, you know, add the constraint that it's not that solution, then it'll come right back with the second one. Um, so we use that extensively in the new Meteor version solver um, to, you know, we have a really detailed specification of um, you know, what we're trying to solve for, what we're trying to optimize, and then we just plug it into Logic Solver and it works. So. Uh, yeah, it's been really great working on it. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Maybe you won't notice anything, or maybe you'll notice your you know, app updating faster, starting up faster, and giving you better error messages. Thank you. Are there, are there any questions for David? Yes. Is there any kind of like debugging? Because if you really have like an old packet and you sometimes make things like why? Yeah. Um, so the question was, uh, can we have better debugging for why you can't update a package? Is that right? Um, so the new solver takes some steps in that direction. It gives you more information. There were just some silly cases where we didn't tell you. You know, we said there was a top-level constraint, but we didn't say what constraint. And it was actually, you know, it would be in some local package that you forgot about. Um, so we have some better error messages now. I think um, probably what would really help is to add a command that just says, like, dump the tree of all the constraints. Um, maybe I'll get that in before, before this goes out, because I, I think that would help a lot. Um, but if it's not able to update something, it will, um, if there's a conflict, it'll always tell you why. What is on my to-do list to add is if anything you told it to update doesn't actually get updated to the very latest version, then it should tell you that, and it should tell you like what held it back. Um, so that's not implemented yet, but that will get implemented between now and release. Any other questions? All right, thank you.